Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Reed Forgrave to discuss his new book, Love, Zach, Small Town Football and the Life and Death of an American Boy, published by our friends at Algonquin. In December 2015, Zach Easter, a 24-year-old from small town Iowa, decided to take his own life rather than continue his losing battle against the traumatic brain injuries he had sustained as a no-holds-barred high school football player. For this deeply reported and powerfully moving true story, award-winning writer Reed Forgrave was given access to Zach's own diaries and was able to speak with Zach's family, friends, and coaches. He explores Zach's tight-knit, football-obsessed Midwestern community. He interviews leading brain scientists, psychologists, and sports historians, and he takes a deep dive into the triumphs and sins of the sports entertainment industry. Reed Forgrave writes about sports and other topics for GQ, the New York Times Magazine, and Mother Jones, among other publications. He's covered the NFL and college football for Fox sports.com and CBS Sports, and he currently writes for the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. The article in which he first wrote about Zach Easter is included in Best American Sports Writing 2018. A past life found him working at the Des Moines Register in Iowa, where he wrote long form narrative journalism and covered the state's first in the nation presidential caucuses. Reed lives in Minneapolis with his wife and two sons and Love, Zach is his first book. To moderate this evening's conversation is Jeff Perlman. Jeff is the New York Times best-selling author of nine books and the co-host of the Two Writers Slinging Yang podcast. He's the former Sports Illustrated senior writer, a former ESPN.com columnist, and a former staff writer for Newsday and the Nashville Tennessean. His latest release, Three Ring Circus, Colby, Shaw, Phil, and the Crazy Years of the Lakers Dynasty comes out in hardcover on September 29, 2020 from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order a copy of Reed's Love, Zach, or pre-order a copy of Three Ring Circus, or any other book you might need for purchase at Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep Books and Books, your locally owned independent bookseller, up and running during very challenging times. But now, without further ado, I'd like to bring our guests to the stage. Hi, Reed. Howdy. Thank you guys so much for having me, uh, especially at such an esteemed bookstore. I am bummed <laughs> by, but I'm so bummed that I can't be there for this, but to do it virtually is, you know, almost as good. Um, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about the main character of my book. Uh, his name's Zach Easter, and I wrote a 288 page book uh, about a young man that I had never met. The first time I heard his name actually was in his obituary. It was like a little bit before Christmas of 2015. I was back home in Pittsburgh. That's where my family's from. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was right before Christmas. And I got an email from an old friend who said, hey, check this obituary out. It was in the Des Moines Register, the newspaper where I used to work. And look, an obituary, I don't even tell you this, an obituary for a 24-year-old man who just took his own life, that's always heartbreaking. But Zach's it was even more so. Uh, it was juxtaposed with a photograph of his huge smile and had all these details that just indicated this really bright future should have been ahead for this guy. He recently graduated from college with a 4.0 GPA. He'd been a decorated soldier in the Iowa National Guard, won the soldier of the year for the entire state. He loved watching the Green Bay Packers with his girlfriend, Allie, and he was so proud of this 10-point buck that he nabbed his senior year of high school. But Zach couldn't see all that. All he saw was just this future where the brain disease that he blamed on playing football, and frankly, on playing football only through high school, that brain disease would destroy him slowly. And so six days before Christmas, Zach committed suicide. 
And it was the final paragraph of this obituary that made me realize that I had to find out more about this tragic tale of Zach Easter. And I, I'd like to read this final paragraph to you. Zach was a selfless person. His last wish was to make sure that no one else has to struggle from head trauma like he did. It is important to Zach to tell his story about CTE, a disease he attempted to manage for years. He suffered from severe migraines, brain tremors, slurred speech, blurred vision, and dementia, among other physical ailments. He's unselfishly donating his brain along with a detailed diary that documented his life so that no one suffers the way that he did. He bravely fought this silent disease for years until he was no longer able. His spirit will always be with us. Zach asked that memorials be donated to the Concussion Legacy Foundation so that further research can be done on this disease. His final request is that people talk about CTE, support more research, and value knowledge. So that's how I found myself. It was on the first Sunday afternoon of 2016, two weeks after Zach committed suicide. And I'm sitting on the floor of Brenda and Miles Easter's living room uh, out in the cornfields and timber of small town Iowa. And mounted on the wall beside me was Zach's 10-point buck. And on the television right behind me was a game between Green Bay Packers, that's Zach's favorite team, and his father's favorite team, the Minnesota Vikings. It, it had been like less than two weeks after he'd taken his dad's 20-gauge shotgun and shot himself in the chest, doing so because he wanted to preserve his brain for science. Their family history here is fascinating to me, and uh, it's all about, it's based on the land. They're a farming family. They've been in Iowa since before the Civil War. And their version of what manhood should look like, it stems from like generations of living off this land. And that that vision of traditional masculinity, it just quickly became apparent when, as I'm sitting there in the living room for like four hours, talking with his parents, talking with his girlfriend, talking with one of his two brothers, talking with family friends about who Zach was and how he died. This whole time, all the men in the room are sneaking glances at the television, trying to find out the score of the game. And we're looking down on our cell phone, trying to find our fantasy football scores. I've spent a lot of my careers examining human suffering. And I honestly believe, truly believe that great meaning about the human condition it can be derived from the lessons we learn from tragedy. I'm really comfortable steering into the pain. Uh, it can annoy my wife at times when we're at a dinner party. Uh, but look, from that first afternoon when I met this Easter family, I just knew there was something, something vital about Zach Easter's story. The first part of that vitality, that importance of the story was that Zach had left behind reams of journals and they just documented his decline. They're absolutely heartbreaking. And the family gave me those journals courageously. Uh, it was remarkable to watch in real time. It's the mood swings, the confusion, just the unpredictable and self-destructive nature that often comes with CTE. And you know CTE, if you don't, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's, uh, it's the brain disease that's become associated with all sorts of contact sports, but especially with football. But look, beyond Zach's personal tragedy, what makes his story, I think, a vital and important tale in today's America is just what he represents. It's a book that's about sports, but it's not a sports book. It's about, frankly, what it means to be a man in 21st century America. It's a book about parenting. I have two sons myself, and I can't tell you how often I was talking with Zach's parents and thinking about my own sons. It's a book about what fathers pass on to their sons, and it's a book about where that, that blurry line between traditional masculinity and what's now referred to as toxic masculinity, where that line resides. Uh, it's about our addiction to violence. We love football because of the violence, not in spite of it. And ultimately, it's it's a book, I hope, that honors Zach's wish, his wish to bring to the forefront his concerns about the safety of the sport, which even to his dying days, he still like deeply, deeply loved. Uh, I hope this book is a book that lives in the nuances, that lives in the grays, and uh, I hope you read it. And I hope uh, saying you enjoy it, it may not be a book that you enjoy. It's not the feel-good book of the year, uh, but it's a book that, I, that will definitely make you think. Whether you love football and think it is the greatest sport known to mankind that helps create 
uh, turn boys into men, uh, or whether you hate football and thinks it's destructive to our boys and men. I, I hope this book will challenge how you feel about football. So thank you. I appreciate you guys coming out and uh, I'd love to bring in the esteemed Jeff Perlman and uh, apologies if I end up asking a lot of questions about Kobe here. I know this is supposed to be about football and CTE, but I just wrote a book about Kobe and Shaq, man. Thank you. And I'm sitting in my daughter's bedroom beneath a big Bo Jackson poster. So I'm, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, in my childhood bedroom. Yeah. I, I, I bought it for I, my kid. It's awesome. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Reed, I read the book. I had you on my podcast. I think it's a great book. Um, one thing I kept thinking is if I were Zach Easter's parents and my son had died, I'm not sure I'd want to talk to anyone. I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable sharing the, you know, intimate details of his life, diary sections that are really personal and, and you know, could be construed as somewhat embarrassing in a way, you know, they're very, very personal. Um, why do they even agree to talk to you? And how did you get them to open up in such a way? Because they, they get very personal, or very detailed. It's a great question because uh, I, I've done a lot of stories about parents who've lost kids. And there's nothing more awkward, I think, in journalism than knocking on that door or making that phone call and saying, hey, I, I know you just had the worst thing happen that anyone could ever experience in their life, have, to lose a kid, often tragically, often violently. Do you want to talk? Um, but there was this blessing. In this tragedy, there was a blessing that Zach gave his parents and sort of by extension gave me. He left behind these journals. And, and in these journals, it, look, it documented this, this harrowing six or so months in his life. And it all, he also wrote this autobiography of sorts where he, that he titled Concussions, My Silent Struggle. Uh, and his parents did pass all this stuff on to me. His girlfriend passed on to me pages and pages of text messages from them uh, in between his two suicide attempts. There were about five weeks between in November when he first attempted suicide and then right before Christmas uh, when he went through with it. And the blessing that Zach gave his parents was to say, look, I've struggled with this and I, I, I want you guys to carry on my legacy by talking about this. Please spread my story. So I remember from that from that first Sunday afternoon sitting in their living room and they're mentioning these journals. And I asked them that literally that very first day, can I see those journals? Uh, th that would be a story that has not been told, especially relating to a, a 24 year old who only played through high school. And they were motivated to do it. This was two weeks after his death. And it was because Zach told him to, he gave them a charge. And I think that is one thing, look, they're never gonna get over this. Their entire lives, you're never gonna get over losing a son, especially in such a dramatic, awful way. But this gave them a way to help move through that pain. And I sort of see this book, which I'm going to show you right here. I see this book as sort of, in a way, a bit of therapy for Zach's parents. Uh, they, they understood, just viscerally understood that this had to be a warts and all story, that his darkest, most embarrassing moments had to be in the story to show uh, to show how bad this is, and then also to sort of accomplish Zach's dying wish to give meaning to his his life and his death. Lost you, Jeff. Can't hear you. <laughs> it's okay. I still, it, it looks like you're on mute, my friend. Um, but when you get off mute, I'm going to – Zach's parents, and uh, they, I believe, are, frankly, are courageous in this, in this story. Just to be able to, to put themselves out there in such a human and painful way. And they've always just understood, like, like I said, from that very first time that I met them. They understood that there's power in, in Zach's story and that, that, is, that that's the part of him that lives on. Um, Jeff, are you there? And if you so, if, Jeff, what I'm going to do is just like X you off and bring you back in and see if you're okay. Let's do that. Go ahead, Reed. I was wondering, this could be a good time uh, to read a, a short excerpt uh, from this book. This is the prologue to this book. And... 
I'm going to caution anyone who's listening. Uh, this is harrowing. This is uh, Zach's first suicide attempt uh, in November of 2015. Uh, this is, I begin the book in a moment of confusion for him, a moment of despair, uh, and really trying to boil down what his issues are. So unless you object, Christina, I'm just going to read, uh, it's about a five minute excerpt. So I won't be droning on too much. Uh, that sounds good. Zach Easter stood on the long wooden dock leaning out onto Lake Aquabi, gripping the 40 cal caliber pistol he'd given his dad for Father's Day not even five months before. The sun had dipped over the horizon on the other side of the Y-shaped lake. Leaves lay in heaps on the fringe of the woods. The, dust, the gusty November winds died down as the sun sank on the horizon, but there was still a chill in the air. Winter was coming. Zach took out his phone and snapped a picture. He posted it to Snapchat, ignoring the frantic calls that were pouring into his phone. God bless America, he captioned the photo. Where is Zach? All around Zach's hometown, friends and family were terrified. They'd seen his Facebook post a few minutes before. If you're reading this, then God bless the times we've had together. Please forgive me. I'm taking the selfish road out. Only God understands what I've been through. I will always watch over you. They needed to stop him. But how? They didn't even know where he was. From the, from the house where Zach grew up, a few miles away and amidst fields of corn, his parents called. Zach did not pick up. From the small town just down the street where Zach had played high school football, and from Des Moines, the big capital city, not quite 20 miles to the north, his friends called. Zach did not pick up. At 5.36 p.m., a college roommate texted him. Hey, what are you up to, bud? No reply. From the law school at Case Western Reserve University, almost 700 miles away in, in Cleveland, Ohio, Allie Epperson, Zach's girlfriend and the only person to whom he had fully confided his struggles with his rapidly deteriorating brain, called. Zach did not pick up. She called again. He did not pick up. She called again. Finally, Zach picked up. There was terror in his voice. I can't do this, he told her. It's never going to get better. Allie, a, a vivacious law student who in many ways was Zach's opposite, a bleeding heart liberal who balanced out Zach's died in the wool conservatism, was freaking out. How many hours had she spent on the phone with him talking about the disease that seemed to be eating his brain from the inside? How many times had the two talked about the sport he loved, the sport that had consumed much of his childhood, but now seemed to be consuming the rest of his life as well? How many times had she told him that a real man was not stoic, and unfeeling, that a real man must face his demons instead of suffering silently in deference to some antiquated ideal of masculinity. How many times had she told him not to apologize to her, that she loved him despite the crazy stuff that was going on, and that they would work through it all together? Earlier on this day, Friday the 13th of all days in November 2015, he had apologized again. I'm sorry you fell in love with a guy with a ducked up brain, Zach had texted her, his phone's autocorrect softening the swear word. He'd awoken early, started drinking, and called Allie in a panic late in the morning, shit-faced and swerving his car around the suburbs. She would coaxed him to drive into a gas station, then into a Jimmy John's to grab a sandwich and sober up. She would calmed him like she always did. He apologized like he always did. She had texted him back. You can't choose who you fall in love with. You just fall in love. Then he had texted an ominous reply. If anything happens to me just by a luck of chance, just by a chance of luck, tell my family everything. Now things were happening. A friend noticed the setting of Zach's Snapchat photo, the beach on Lake Aquati, where Zach and Allie had escaped to in the summer to get away from high school friends and stare at the clouds. The lake was just down the road from his family's house. The lake's name is derived from an ancient Algonquian language. It means resting place. Allie kept Zach on the phone. Listen to the sound of my voice, she soothed him. Listen to the sound of my voice. I'm losing my mind, he cried. This is it for me. One Warren County Sheriff's Office cruiser came speeding down the winding hill toward the lake, followed by another. Allie, did you send those cops here? The cops got closer to him. He started apologizing to Allie. And he told her he wanted his brain donated for research. Then Zach's phone cut out. Out on the dock, 
Zach pointed the pistol at the darkened sky and fired a warning shot. That's when a pickup truck sped down the hill and slammed to a stop next to the lake. Zach's father, a burly former high school football coach named Miles Easter, jumped out. The parking lot quickly filled with squad cars. One deputy, a former all-conference linebacker who played for Miles on the same high school team Zach had played for, trained his assault rifle on Zach. Lasers from other police rifles danced on Zach's body. The evening was dark and it was getting cold. Miles saw the cherry red 2008 Mazda 3 that Zach called Old Red. He peered into the window of his son's car. He saw an empty six pack of Coors Light, an empty bottle of Captain Morgan rum, and a pill bottle. Red lights illuminated Zach. A black curtain fell on the water behind him. Zach stood up from a picnic table and walked down the pier toward a wooden fishing hut at water's edge. A few more steps and he'd be inside, alone on the water, out of sight. Put your gun down, the deputy shouted. Nope, Zach yelled with an anguished laugh. Not going to do that. In a flash, Zach's father realized what was happening. Zach wants the police to shoot him. Fuck it, Miles said to himself. I can't let this happen. Zach's father sprinted past the sheriff's deputies and onto the pier. Zach, he shouted. If he shoots me, he shoots me, the father thought. Dad, stop. As Miles Easter ran toward his son, Zach's face came into focus. His blue eyes looked foggy and confused. The expression on his still boyish face matched the tenor of his voice. Sad, sick, exhausted, scared, worn down by life, beaten once and for all. Zach, I'm coming, Miles said. Put your gun down. Dad, Zach shouted. Dad, stop. Then, gripping his father's pistol, Zach disappeared into the fishing hut. The door slammed shut behind him, and Zach Easter was alone. Like I said, it's not the feel-good book of the year, but I do think it's really important. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's how it starts, and it goes into sign each chapter is a, a chapter of Zach's story and then expands out to sort of the story of football and what it means to America. Can you hear me okay, Reed? Got you, brother. Okay. Um, you know, we talked about this in my podcast, and I'm actually kind of interested about this. So um, we both written about concussions in our careers in sports and sort of the damage and CTE. Um, I wrote a book about Walter Payton, where clearly at the end of his life, he was really struggling with sort of the, the maladies of a broken brain. And I asked you this in my podcast, and I, I just think it's an interesting sort of topic. Like, um, can you make the argument that he had no choice? Like his brain was just broken and he didn't feel like it was going to get better. And maybe it wouldn't have gotten better. Like maybe I'm not saying I'm a fan of suicide or the idea of suicide, but maybe he just felt there's nothing is working and I am miserable and I don't know what to do. I mean, that, that is absolutely the way that he felt like you can see it in his, in his writings uh, that this, this, this time period between that, what I just read was November 13th and the time period between that and December 15th, it sounds like, and his family believes, and his girlfriend believes that this whole time he, he was planning that. His family had signed him up for a clinic in California after Christmas, that he was gonna go to California. Um, and it, it treats both concussion, like post-concussion stuff, traumatic brain injury, and addiction, is he had all sorts of issues. I don't know what the chicken is or the egg is, but he had all sorts of stuff going on. He wasn't planning to go to that. He told his family he was. Uh, it's no coincidence that he waited until Allie was done with her finals at law school and came back home before he followed through with this. Uh, but at that time in 2015, when he's seeing all this news, all these news stories and hearing about Junior Seau and Mike Webster and uh, Dave Dewerson, uh, I think he completely lost hope. Uh, absolutely. Is it, I think there is some hope. I think there's absolutely hope for people who are dealing with issues like Zach is doing. Will they live the same life? Will they be the same person that they used to be? No. Uh, in Zach's journals, you hear him saying, I just wish I were the same old Zach Easter again, that, that fun-loving kid, that, that his nickname was, was Hode, and it was a shortened version of Odie, which is that like lovable dog from uh, from the Garfield comics, because he everyone loved Zach, and he felt like he was no longer the person that he identified with being. I don't think he could have been the same person, but with therapy, with working on his memory, with working on a speech, as he was doing, 
was also muddling that up with with addiction, he could have had a very, I think, rewarding life, especially when you look at the support system around him with Allie and his parents and, and his friends. He did have a good support system. I absolutely see why he did lose hope. Uh, if you look at the science of this, uh, this is there's not going to be a magic pill uh, in the next year that's going to cure CTE. When I went to a brain conference and the phrase I kept hearing was the infancy of the science. This feels like cancer in the 1950s. Uh, I see why he lost hope, but I also see, you know, it's been five years and uh, there's a lot more awareness. I know awareness is such a you know, vague word, but people are paying attention to this in a way that they weren't even just five years ago. And uh, I think people know how to treat it. The, the doctor in the book, uh, there's, a, there's a, a large chapter that is dedicated to uh, one of Zach's doctors uh, who was dealing with post-concussion issues. And he had been uh, in Afghanistan with the military and had headed up a concussion unit in Afghanistan. That doctor, Sean Spooner, this month in, uh, in the suburbs of Des Moines, Iowa, he's opening a brand new uh, two-story concussion clinic that follows the same protocols that they were doing in Afghanistan. Uh, so like there is hope. But if you want hope tomorrow, this is going to be fixed. You ain't going to get that. This is a long, long process to get through that. What is the um, what is the argument for football when, you know, in your book, people talk about football and all it's given them. And every time I read it, I think, well, you could fill in baseball track, running, you know, uh, water polo, softball, like all those things also bring bonding and cohesiveness and teamwork and togetherness and blah, blah, blah. Now hearing the 8 million story of someone suffering really bad problems from football, either physical or mental, what exactly are the remaining arguments for football? So I, to, to, a, to a large extent, buy into one specific argument for football. And I'm curious your take on this because I, I think I didn't play football. I'm, you know, not that athletic and gifted and went to a, went to a big high school. I was the backup, uh, backup catcher at North Allegheny High School. Um, but uh, but when you talk with people who play football, and I and I believe this, like there's no other sport that has that camaraderie as football. The the idea that it's it's not just you and your four teammates trying to put a ball through a hoop, but you guys are going to war. I, all the cliches that every like coach will tell you, it's not just your bus full of 60, 70 teammates and cheerleaders and coaches and trainers that are going to the next town. It's half of your small town in Iowa that drives at 45 minutes and goes to see Friday Night Lights. There's something about the camaraderie that football brings us together that I don't think any sport outside of maybe like basketball in Indiana uh, brings for us. And I, there's value. Look, it leads to some really destructive tendencies, uh, specifically battling through the pain of concussions. But the idea of fighting through pain. Uh, I I want my sons to be tough. I don't want them to be that tough. I want them to, to, to worry about their brain health. I want to be smart about this, but I think there's value in fighting through pain in order to, to, to you know, all the metaphors of football fight through pain for this greater goal that this, this group of people are all getting together for. Do you, do you, are you calling bullshit on me there or do, do you buy into it? I do think football's different. I think it's different. I don't think it's worth the payoff. Like I think what I got again, like I, so I ran track and cross country in college. Yeah. Not well, but I did. <laughs> and everything you're talking about, like fighting through. So, oh. you know, you're running the 3000 and you have two laps to go and you're dying. Like that's fighting through, um, basketball workouts where you're running suicides, you know, not, I hate to use that term actually, but running these horrible, you know, sprints and well, that's fighting through. I'm just not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. I've just covered way too many football players who are battered, beaten, yeah. being fed with a spoon. You know, it just it just seems like it takes a lot out of a lot of people. Do you still watch football? Do you still are you planning to turn on the TV and and a little bit less than an hour and see the Chiefs kick off the NFL season? I didn't even know they were playing tonight. Ah, look at you. I am, and I feel like a hypocrite, right? Um, and I feel like I've compartmentalized my morality, and I feel like the the idea that I gave up fantasy football while writing this book is such a, such a really like, I'm going to give up fantasy football. This is my, this is what I'm going to do to make myself clearer about this. Uh, I'm conflicted about it. When I look at my sons, it's probably not even something that, uh, that would ever come to this. Cause I think my wife is like, no way. 
right now, I don't want either of my sons to play football. Um, I'm going to put this window down a little bit. Um, I don't want either of my sons to play football. But it's a different question when it's looking at my four-year-old and being like, ah, he didn't want to play football versus 10 years from now. And he's like, all my high school friends are going out for the team, dad. And, uh, you know, everyone's doing it. And it's so much fun. And it's safe now. And we've been watching the Vikings downstairs for a decade. What do you mean I can't play? It's a, it's a different question, right? Yeah. Yeah. What would, um, what would, if uh, Zach Easter's parents wind up grandparents um, and they have other kids, obviously, how do you think they would feel about their grandkids playing football? They would, I mean, his mother specifically, his father, his mother would say no. Our grand, She's already said, when we have grandkids, they do not play football. Uh, they can do track and field. They can do basketball. They can do something that isn't this dangerous. Uh, so much like me and my wife, like Miles Easter, his father, I don't think we'll really have a choice. Um, but he has this, he's, I think, the most fascinating character in this book outside of Zach because he's hes the man's man, right? He grew up being the farmhand and shooting guns. Uh, he's, he's not someone who expresses his emotions. He still, part of him still loves football, uh, a significant part of him. Part of him still think, thinks like, Football's too sissified right now. That the, the problem isn't that that we're not protecting our kids enough. It's that we're protecting them too much. Uh, he also sees the danger. I think he's very conflicted. But um, to me, look, I think someone can look at that and be like, "What is he thinking?" I look at that and be like, "Look, this is a guy who's like very definition of like who he is as a man has been in a large part formed by this sport that he grew up playing, that he played in college at a division one level that he coached at the college level and then coached at the high school level with his sons. And then to be told now in his fifties that this sport that you believe not, not, isn't just fun to play, but creates strong men uh, that, well, that, that sport is evil. I think that's a hard pill to swallow. And frankly, like it's a stand in, I think for America right now, football, the most interesting part of researching this book, has been looking into the history of football and how parallel it runs with kind of America's rise as a world superpower. How Teddy Roosevelt, 100 years ago, they're talking about banning football at Harvard, I believe. And he said, I don't want, I don't want this nation to turn out a bunch of mollycoddles. That's a, that's a great word. It's my favorite word. Right. Mollycoddles, right? Is, I mean, is there something to that of like physical strength in men, that traditional masculinity, or is that view of masculinity from a hundred years ago, not just antiquated, but toxic? I mean, did you see, I don't know if you, did you see what uh Skip Bayless tweeted out, tweeted out earlier today? I try to avoid. What yeah. I unfortunately am a masochist. Uh, <laughs> uh, on, <sighs> Let me see if I have it right here. He said he ripped on Dak Prescott on Fox Sports One, whose brother died in April of an apparent suicide. Dak, Dak was battling depression, and he spoke out about having depression in the wake of his uh, brother's suicide. Skip Bayless goes on the air and says, basically, Zach, Dak is weak for speaking about this because he's supposed to be a quarterback of the Cowboys, America's team. He's supposed to be a leader of men. That's toxic masculinity, right? But yeah. like football in general, being smart about it, is that toxic? I think I lean toward no, but I'm I'm torn, you know? Would you have, if you had done fantasy football this year, would your team have been called the Molly Coddles? <laughs> I feel like every team that I do in fantasy anything needs to be the Molly, Molly Coddles. I do fantasy baseball and fantasy basketball. Uh, which fair. Way, way too much time. There's so time. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you uh, when you read the passage from the book, I wonder, like, uh, like, interesting question here. Like, you've now probably read. You've report. You reported it. You reported it as a story. You reported it as a book. You probably read your book now a gazillion times, going through edits. You've had edits go. Editors go through it. Go back. Proposal. The whole thing. When you read it now. Does it come relatively emotionless or when you read the story, do you still feel sort of the sadness or have you heard it 40 times and it kind oh, of really, it loses? Great question. Um, I think it's, I think it's the latter, unfortunately, like when, when, when I'm reading it, I've only done a few of these readings. Uh, 
And every time I read it, I'm like, oh, I should have done this with that sentence. So I actually hate kind of reading it because you just see where, where it could have been a little bit better uh, or a little bit different. But I, frankly, I, I kind of like see it as a performance that I'm trying to trying to replicate the emotion. But uh, you know what it's like, man. You got like 80,000 to 100,000 words and you've seen so much of it and you just don't want to see it anymore. Uh, w- w- there are certain parts in the book uh, not that prologue because I've read it so many times. But there are certain parts of the book that do get to me, and most of it has to do with with father and son and with uh, this tortured relationship that Miles Senior has uh, with his son killing himself and with football in general. Because you know, that's I put myself right in his shoes. Right. Um... What was it like showing them the book for the first time? And how nervous were you about the reaction the fans would have? I was so nervous. I didn't want them to see it before it was published because I, I, I didn't I didn't want to have a negative reaction for them to freak out because I, I was worried. There was one detail in – I had this talk with Brenda Easter. That's Zach's mom. Uh, probably early summer when we had just the galley copies of the book and we could still make kind of small edits. And I was talking with her about how I – frankly didn't want her to read the book before it came out. Um, And I mentioned one detail and she's like, if you can leave out that one detail, uh, that would be incredibly meaningful to us because it it is the one detail that, that tore Zach's father up. And I did, I mean, if she's going to spend all this time and and be so personal with me and show her, you know, share her family's deepest and darkest moments. uh, Of course I would give her that. Um, But the, the publisher <laughs> screwed up and ended up sending her a galley copy anyway. And I was on edge for weeks until I heard from her um, and, and, uh, and uh, Zach's girlfriend, Allie, they've been involved in sort of like the rollout process. And uh, his, his mother told me she was dreading this week. Uh, I was texting with her today. She says she, she's, she's had nightmares come up again, but she, and it's really, it's obviously it's painful. Like the world, not the world, but however many, hundreds of people by this book are hearing this family's biggest pain. Uh, but, but I think she, she's from, from the jump, from the first time I met her. And this is, I mean, maybe unique among sources that I've had in my journalistic career. Like she recognized the power of this tragedy to affect potential change in the future. So she, she, she sees that even though I think she, she hates reading the book because it is so personal. Right. Do you think um, do you think this is the kind of story like you're going to go on and you're going to write other stories and maybe you write other books and it's five years past and 10 years past and you kind of just go on? Like, do you feel like you are having an emotional connection to, to this story? Or, I mean, we do write a lot of emotionally connected stories in our careers generally. Eventually, we'll kind of fade away and it'll just be something that you experience for a really intense four-year period. Sure. I, I mean, I, I think it will be something that, that sticks with me for life. Uh, I have one of my issues in journalism. I can be a little bit too empathetic, get too like emotionally involved with sources. I can't tell you how many times, whether it's in person or over the phone, I was, you know, crying. I was just straight up bawling, talking with, with Miles and Brenda and Allie and, and other family members. Uh, I think for the story like this, you almost need that. You need to dive into it and then back up. To, to be a little bit more unbiased. Um, but I, I don't want to get into like too, too spiritual, too woo woo, but like the, I saw this story as kind of a calling, uh, sort of a, a journalistic duty. I, I'm good at talking about really awful moments. I'm terrible at confrontation. I'd be an awful political reporter, but I'm really good at, at, at you know, finding, finding meaning from suffering. Um, and I had this deep connection to Iowa where I lived there for a decade. So I feel like in a way, like I was meant to find this story and I was meant to try to get it to as big of an audience as possible. So I hope, I, I hope 10 years from now, I'm still talking with, uh, the Easter family. Uh, every time I go to Iowa, I hope I share beers with them, uh, at their kitchen table, which we did many times in the past. Can you tell this, this may be a, a cornball question. Zach Easter doesn't commit suicide. He lives and he goes through this. Are him, are him and his girlfriend, because I couldn't really tell from the from the book in a way, are they just young love and they wind up, you know, like Kevin Arnold and Winnie Cooper sort of in different <laughs> past years now or Winnie. do you think 20 years? 
Hey, everyone loves winning. Or do you think 20 years from now they're um, like, is it, was it a fleeting relationship or do you feel like it was a meant to be relationship? Uh, Winnie's my childhood crush, by the way. Um, of course. Adored Winnie. Um, yeah. I think it was meant to be. Uh, Allie has tattoos of Zach. She bought herself after he died. He left behind some money for her. She bought herself sort of a, a wedding ring of sorts uh, because she sees herself as a widow. Um, they fell in love early. They were, they, they were good friends in high school for the last couple of years of high school. She was one year behind him. Uh, there's her senior year. He was in college and they, the first time they hook up uh, is New Year's Eve, which by the way, his parents uh, first met up on New Year's Eve as well. 30 some years before that. Uh, nice little parallel there. Um, but they were always together. It wasn't just like, I got the sense that they were, soulmates that's how ali refers to it they're very different but it's sort of like yin to his yang in a way uh she's like this liberal spitfire and he's got a little bit of a little bit of trump in him a little bit of uh you know down home iowa in him um don't speak ill of the dead sorry <laughs> he had a in his, in his bedroom in his childhood bedroom he had the art of the deal uh sitting there and a bunch of other like I and mean, this is before trump was what Trump is, uh, right. he wasn't president, but uh, he had a bunch of like these motivational books. Uh, I think they were meant to be, to be completely honest. They, and honestly, this is something I didn't write about in the book, but Ali shared with me this video, uh, you know, months before he committed suicide. And it was a video of him shot in their phone and he's like pretending to pick her nose and being completely goofy and, it just felt so, like such an authentic love between these guys that they just, they were just utterly comfortable with each other. Yeah. Wait, there's a, uh, there's a question here that I'll read to you. Oh, it said, uh, there's a high school. This is from Andre's. It says there's a high school right behind our home in Wisconsin. The practices are remarkable and sound alone. Grown men yelling angrily at kids for hours. Isn't it really toxic masculinity on display? It might be. It might be. I mean, I think it depends on the, uh, on the coach. I think it depends on the program. Uh, there's a friend that I have who's from Minnesota, lives in Canada now, played quarterback for a division three national champion, a place called St. John's University. You may have heard of St. John's University because John Gallardi is, I think, the winningest coach in college football history. I wrote a story about him a decade ago. Um, and I talked with this guy. Uh, by the way, he suffers big time issues from concussions. And he's like, I do it all over again. Uh, I am who I am because of John Gallardi and because of that football program. He's super successful in the business world. Uh, and John Gallardi is a guy that before people were doing, a lot of coaches are doing like low contact or no contact football practices. John Gallardi was doing that 20 years ago before that became a way to, to, to save people. Um, there's plenty of toxic masculinity in football. I, I, I think that is, a no doubter uh is the is the sport is that essential to the sport i don't think so i've i've been a, around a lot of locker rooms um and frankly i think the most to i'd be curious your your answer to this i think the most to toxic is uh baseball locker rooms uh i find them to be misogynistic in a way that that i've never experienced in football you know i think one of the problems is we uh, sometimes we confuse tradition uh, for just repetition, right? And there are a lot of things that happen in football that don't have to happen in football. Like I've seen a lot of high school coaches who belittle players and you really don't need to. And they say, well, that's how we did it back in the day. But maybe when you, how you did it back in the day just wasn't right. Or how, you know, I'm writing a book right now about Bo Jackson. And when Bo Jackson was at Auburn, like they weren't getting enough water. They just weren't given enough water. And well, why aren't you giving them more water? Because we got to make toughness. We got to make toughness. And like a lot of times, just these things you keep doing, you're just doing it because it was done before you. And it's not necessarily right. And there are really good football programs where they don't feel like they have to belittle the players, where they do give them plenty of water, where they give them plenty of rest, where they value sleep as much as they value physicality, where they do much less pad work than they have to. And it just seems like one of the problems with sports is we rely so much on the idea of tradition 
that we do not allow ourselves to think maybe those traditions aren't always so beneficial. Well, look at look at someone like Pete Carroll, uh, coach of the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, he's, I think, a mo- very much a modern day coach, and he's someone who's invented. They call it hawk tackling. It's basically like a rugby style tackle where you, you take. I don't completely understand it. But basically, tackle with the shoulder, leave the head out. Uh, he treats his players like like professionals, not like athletes, but like like you would in a, in a solid business environment. I think any culture, whether it's a high school football culture onto the NFL, onto like Google, onto the newspaper that I work at, every organization has a corporate culture. And I think it's the same with football. Uh, it really depends on the team. Uh, I mean, I've, I've written a lot about uh, and been around a lot of basketball teams, uh, college basketball and NBA. And the difference between in the power dynamic between college basketball players and their coach and NBA players and their coach is, is night and day. I've seen so many abusive, straight up abusive college coaches that don't make the news. Uh, you know, that doesn't fly in the NBA because the power dynamic shifted. NBA is such a professional league where, and I think that's why the NBA has become such a socially active league because they really empower their players. Um, it's all about culture. And I think there are, I think football culture has changed in, in very obvious ways. Like you don't see on ESPN, he got jacked up. You don't see those segments anymore. You don't see those films from NFL films that are showing like concussion of the week, basically. Um, but it, it, it's changed in subtle ways too. sort of the professionalizing of the sport and the, safety of flying of the sport but yeah there's i mean if there's a sport that is that the toxic masculinity fits with both best i mean it's of course it's football F- football or boxing i would suppose right yeah i would agree with that um wait we have another question from myron what was the most difficult part about organizing the book it seems to me one of the toughest parts about book writing good question uh, myron. i was terrified because it's like you get a contract for a hundred thousand words and you're like oh fuck um i i'm this sounds dumb i'm proud of my structure i'm proud of my outline i wouldn't have been able to write a book without an outline that absolutely made sense and then i was able to break it up into 10 chapters and be like all right this is just 10 10 000 word magazine articles i can do this and i frankly broke each chapter into three parts uh it's it, it doesn't follow that structure all the way through the book but the general structure is I don't want to call it formulaic because it's a story, but the way that I have it is each chapter is a section of Zach's story. Uh, You know, chapter one is basically Zach's childhood as he's falling in love with football. Uh, The beginning and end of the chapter is about Zach's story, and the middle of the chapter is about how America fell in love with football and sort of the history of when when this nation, when football passed baseball as as America, truly America's sport. Um, There's a, a section about, uh, his his meetings with when he's really descending and he's going to all these doctors and it's a section that very much focuses on uh, this concussion doctor that I spoke about earlier. Middle of that section I, is me going to a brain injury conference at University of North Carolina. So if it weren't for that structure, I would have gotten twenty five thousand words in and had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, uh, we have another question, also from Myron. For aspiring writers who are curious about how unstable full-time jobs are in writing, can you give us some insight on the process of breaking into book writing? Oh, God. Um, I got lucky. I mean, I, I, I legitimately, like, I've knocked on the door with magazines for, for years, for decades. Um, I, I found this story, like I said, right after, right after Christmas, right before Christmas when I found it. I, I visit the family the first Sunday in January, and I knew right away, I'm like, this is a book, but in order to get a book, you got to write a magazine article. Um, and in order to write a magazine article, you need contacts of magazines. I didn't frankly have any. I was just a guy who was writing for Fox Sports, uh, writing well, but like I was an unknown. And I sent a blind pitch into a guy named Devin Gordon, who was an ed- used to be executive editor at GQ. Mm-hmm. And I knew that GQ had published some of the seminal works on CTE and concussions, uh, Gene Marie Laskus wrote the article that became the book that became the movie concussion with Will Smith came out in 2010, same year Zach Easter graduated from high school. Um, and I got lucky cause Devin kind of took a risk on me and took a risk on the story. Cause he, he recognized that it was a story 
And then I had this wonderful uh, editor for Best American Sports Writing who decided to choose my story to put it in there. Just, Huge mistake. Yeah, Huge mistake. An idiot. Um, I was drunk. Okay, Jay. <laughs> as you should be. But uh, and after the story was published, I mean, it got a decent amount of buzz when it came out in January 2017. And a few agents, literary agents reached out and uh, I vibed with one of them and he helped me. I had no idea how to write a book proposal. He helped me write a proposal. I wrote a, uh, that, that the prologue that I read was, was part of my proposal as was chapter one of the book. And I sent it out to the world and I prayed and it didn't sell. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sucks. And I came back and I reframed it a little more about toxic masculinity. And I sent it back to my, to my, uh, uh agent. And, uh, I, I'll remember where I was. I was at Cameron indoor arena doing interviews, TV interviews with Duke basketball players. And I got a call from my agent saying your book just sold. And it was like five months after I uh, submitted the proposal. And, uh, you know, all it takes is one, uh, there were a bunch of publishers that it got to that point where they were, it was almost sold to like a, I think it was a random house or something like one of the big ones. I just didn't make it quite past the final approval guy, but I, I just got one Algonquin person who believed in, believed in the story and uh, believed in me. But honestly, I think it's, it, it's keep knocking at the door, keep writing the shorter stories that are powerful to become longer stories that are powerful that become, that can eventually become a book. Uh, what do you think, Jeff? You have a better answer than I would to this, I'm sure. Oh, man. I actually think you, I was actually thinking everything you just said is exactly how I feel about it. I, <laughs> uh, I really do. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. Do you enjoy that? Did you enjoy it? Like, did you enjoy it? Which part? The writing part? Yeah. Like, did you enjoy this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I really did. Uh, honestly, the, I love writing. Um, the, the hardest part was actually sitting down and doing the writing, uh, yeah. which is something I th usually enjoy, but it was just so intimidating. I, I, I enjoyed the reporting and the editing more than I did the writing, to be completely honest. Uh, yeah, the writing is terrible. It is. It, it is, man. I got to go upstairs later tonight to write something for my day job. And I'm, yeah. even that, I'm dreading. Um, yeah, I really did enjoy it. It was it was a fun process. What I didn't enjoy, I can't remember if I talked about this on the podcast or not, but uh, I was in the arena for the NBA Finals uh, when my computer uh, died. I lost my entire hard drive. And oh. this idiot had my manuscript saved on my hard drive, uh, didn't have it in Google Docs. I had luckily, a month before emailed a copy to my wife. So I'd only lost like a month's of work, but like that was, I've never been so devastated on the street corner in Berkeley, California, uh, being being told by this like computer shop, being like, sorry, man, it is gone. It Wait, just, time out. Yeah. Let's do, um, since we have this visual medium, let's do a reenactment. I will be the computer shop, okay? Oh. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go, action. Uh, I'm sorry, it's all gone. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> You're joking, right? I'm a little bit drunk right now because when you were working on this, I was across the street at that uh, at that bar. I had like four beers. Wait, wait, how, how can you fix it, actually, sir? Yeah, we can't. Bravo. Wait. Okay, time to call my wife and cry on the street corner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah, good. Not great, man. No, not, we all had that moment. No. We all had that moment. Oh. Um, wait, someone asked, uh, Barney asked, will football change? Are these stories having an impact? has to change. It already has changed, I think, incrementally. Um, I think this is an existential question for football, and I think Roger Goodell and everyone who really thinks about football knows this is an existential question. They can fix and are doing a passable or better than passable job from youth sports through the NFL of taking out what I'd call unnecessary roughness, uh, hits to the head, right? The big hits that will now get you Hopefully, most of the time, at least a 15-yard penalty and kicked out of the game. There are plenty of times when I'm yelling at my screen being like, Vontae's perfect needs to be kicked out of the league. Forget about getting kicked out of the game. Uh, you are just a dirty player and a dirty human being. The bigger question about football is the smaller hits, the sub-concussive hits that happen on every single play. Uh, how, 
how, how do those lead to post-concussion type syndrome? How do those lead to CT? If though if there's science that comes out in five years or 10 years that say, actually, it's these, these sub-concussive hits that are the big problem, I think in a generation or two, football will go away because no one's watching the National Flag Football League. Yeah. Although I actually did watch one of those games where like Michael Vick was playing. They were mildly entertaining, I got to say. They're yeah. on YouTube. They're not terrible. I swear to God. I'm looking uh, at it today, man. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Um, uh, all right, someone who identified as Roy Williams fan. Go figure. Oftentimes in feature writing, they tell us to maintain distance from our subjects. This book obviously would not have been possible without close ties to the family. How did you navigate gaining trust and intimacy without crossing boundaries? I cross boundaries, frankly. Like, I cried with them. Uh, I care for them. This story is essentially told from their son's point of view. I, I honestly think I cross emotional boundaries. I don't cross ethical boundaries, right? Like, I, I, I have my ethics that are very strong uh, about not lying and, and being truthful. But I think you got to give a little to get a lot in journalism. And I, as, as long as I'm comfortable with it, I, I'm happy to give a little. I talk about my family all the time in reporting. I talk about, I mean, with the Easter family, I've talked about my struggles throughout my life with mental health and how, you know, I, I can identify in a way with what Zach's going through. Um, it depends on the types of stories that you're writing. But in st with stories like this, I think you have to somewhat get emotionally involved and then realize after you get emotionally involved, you have to tell the story as it is. Uh, I It's probably one of my biggest flaws as a writer and a journalist is that I try to like heroicize my characters a little too much because I think I do try to empathize and identify with them. I was going to say your biggest flaw is you didn't wear a tie for this. What the? I just, I mean, you know. I went right over there. This is my bedroom after all. Yeah. <laughs> bedroom, which is our yeah. bedroom. I actually, I, I do want to say there's another question, but before I do that, um, one thing I like about this book, I really mean this and like books like this, is the same stigmas about sort of mental health um, and seeking help. They don't exist now that they did obviously when our parents were growing up and you would never even, if you went to a therapist, heaven forbid, it would you would never talk about it. it would, you know, it's not something, we, it would be maybe you, you would whisper it with your wife and that, but, and I do like that this, I do think books like this open up the idea of the importance of seeking help and also, that it's not embarrassing to seek help. That's it. And that's why I agree with you about Skip Bayless. That's one of the biggest dog shit things I've heard anyone say. Because I mean, you should, this guy should be, well, he should be, if anything, Prescott should be celebrated, number one, for, for having whatever it took to seek help and then to talk about it and make other people feel comfortable about it. So I just, I think books like this and guys like Dax Prescott coming out and discussing it, hugely important. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of like raising awareness, I feel like it's such a vague thing that people just throw out there in order to tell a story. But I think especially with mental health, man, like awareness is everything because uh, Zach was embarrassed about this. He was embarrassed about his weaknesses. And if he was less embarrassed, uh, maybe he things wouldn't have ended the way they did. Yeah. Um, there's a final question here, which is uh, how did Zach describe his physical pain? He had this word that, that that is not in medical dictionaries that he refers to as brain tremors. Uh, and fr from what I gather, it's like lightning hitting his brain for five seconds and he completely just like loses it. Uh, there are all sorts of, I mean, I think the, the physical pain, that's the main one. Like there, there are times where he's struggling with stamina and the depression just affects us, it affects him in all different ways. But that brain tremor was the main thing uh, as far as that physical pain. More of it is just this frustration of having a memory that isn't what it used to be, of knowing there's something wrong with him and he can't, didn't feel like he could fix it. Um, it was... It's, it's devastating to read. It's so sad because there are moments in his journals where he has all the confidence in the world. Um, he's making these lists of like, here are my life goals for, I'm going to quit chewing tobacco this week. And then, you know, 10 years, I'm going to have such and such car and be a millionaire and go to Lambeau field at least once a year. Um, and then the next day he's like, I don't, it's not worth living. I can't do it anymore. Uh, right. Drive to his therapist and sit in the parking lot for an hour and not walk in. Right. Um, let me ask you a final question. 
Yeah, we are. we've been doing an hour. It's pretty good. Um, so here we are. We're both in a similar situation. You wrote a book that came out a few days ago. I have a book that comes out in about two weeks. It's a pandemic. Um, how has this been? I mean, I always describe a book release almost like a bar mitzvah wedding type thing where it's really exciting and there's a lead up and you can't wait and blah, blah, blah. And it comes. Number one, you're doing this during a pandemic. Number two, you didn't write exactly about a joyful topic right. where people, you know, it's not like a topic where people are like, oh, I cannot wait to talk right. about. Um, has it been a tough sort of thing to promote a book like that and to promote it during a time period like this? I mean, in one way, it's like we can do things on Zoom and everyone's used to Zoom in a way that they weren't used to it eight months ago. Um, I'm guessing there's more people on this Zoom thing than there would have been if we had done this uh, back in January. But uh, but yeah, I mean, one is the topic of the book. It's it's important. It's vital. It's depressing. Of course it is. It's a book about suicide and concussions. Uh, I'm I'm very curious. I have no idea how this book will land. Uh, I'm very nervous about it, and almost to the point of I can't sleep over it. But uh, I don't know if it's like going to be one of those things where people are like, I don't want to read about something so depressing in 2020, the worst year ever, or if it hits some sort of zeitgeist where people are like, I'm depressed anyway. I'm going to read about something important. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to land. Um, the, I mean, just on a personal level, like it's been a little bit anticlimactic. I've been a nervous wreck the past. Oh week just up and down nervous and excited can't sleep uh super pumped about my book really sad that, that, that i'm not in miami right now it's it, it's been a lot of back and forth in that uh when the books i mean i think i told you about this on the podcast when i got the first books in the mail two packages of books uh it was three weeks ago and it was like a wednesday morning or something and my wife's like your books came and I was stressed out about trying to get my kid in a pod and I'm yelling at my other kid for whatever reason. I'm trying to go to my, and I'm, I'm late for an interview for my work and I'm like opening up. I was like, Hey, this is cool. I just, I didn't have that. Like your first book, you're supposed to be like, wow, this is, uh, you know, this, this, th this moment I've dreamed about and really have dreamed about. Um, yeah. it's been a bit of a bummer. Um, but, uh, you know, th th there have been really cool moments too. And frankly, none cooler than, getting this just lovely text from Zach's mother uh, on Tuesday night, we did the, uh, the launch event in uh, with the Des Moines public library, did it online, uh, a bunch of family and friends and people from Iowa and Zach's mom sent me the most uh, like, like, like it was basically like, thank you for being the one who could spread my son's story in a, in a thoughtful and authentic way. And that, that, that was where the emotions hit me and I started crying. Um, so that That's was really cool. special. And I hope that, Ultimately, that's what this book is uh, remembered for, I guess, is continuing this man's legacy. And I'll say to you what I said to you, actually, I'll say again, because I just thought of it again, what I said to you when we did the podcast, which is books come and books go. And you go into a bookstore, you go into a library, and there are a gazillion books, right? And it actually makes you realize the achievement isn't quite the achievement you thought it was, because right. if, if a million people can write a book. But I really do mean this. like, And I said it to you. like You wrote a book that... 200 years from now, 99.99999% of the world may never know existed, but mm -hmm. somewhere in Zach Easter's great, great nephew's house, you know, there will be a copy of this book. And I suspect 400 years from now, heaven forbid, you know, hopefully this earth still exists, but you know, <laughs> it is a book that will mean something to that family for generations and generations. And it will tell a story that they will be retelling. And it, it keeps a legacy of someone alive but would have been long forgotten. And I just think that is an insanely awesome sort of little landmark for you to have. So if all else fails, you have that. And that's pretty meaningful. I, think. I agree, man. I agree. That's a, uh, and that's a very meaningful way to say it. That was my wife's favorite insight of your podcast was that one right there. Oh, nice. Your podcast. wife has good taste. Yeah. She's nice. Clearly. Um, yeah. Well, Rita, I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap here. Right? So for us, Every debut is something to celebrate. And your labor and the time you spent on this book is something that we value. And so I'd like to rem remind everyone that's watching from everywhere that you can order a copy of Love, Zach at Books and Books below on the green button. So please press away. This is a wonderful book. We are delighted to have been able to present it at Books and Books. And we thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you.
And hey. next time in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone already. 